This is our uh, Regional Technical Advisory Committee meeting. And I'm Barton Brierly. I'm with Ogden and I'm the chair. And I see we have Ali Avery, who's the vice chair, is on. So um, we are going to start uh, with introductions, just a little roll call. So if you're there, please uh, tell us you're here. And I'm going to start uh, with Pleasant View and work down in the alphabet and then start over just to kind of break things up a little bit. So uh, do we have anybody from Pleasant View here? How about Riverdale? Roy? South Ogden? South Weber? Sunset? Syracuse? Present. Uh, Uinta? Washington Terrace? Weber County? I'm here, Commissioner Bolos. Thank you. Uh, West Bountiful. West Haven. West Point. Willard. Woods Cross. You died. Yeah, they're there. Oh. Woods Cross, we had somebody? Okay, UDOT. Uh, UTA, I know we have. Matt Gray with UTA Planning. Michelle Larson, UTA Government Relations. Bill Bishop, UTA. FHWA, anybody? Uh, WFRC, I know we've got a bunch. I'll run through that list. We got our Deputy Director, Ted Knowlton, uh, Julie Born Bjornstad, Hugh Van Wagenen, Seamus Gueda, um, Jordan Chandler, Andrea Pearson, and Marsha White, who might be wearing two hats as WFRC and Ogden City, and myself, George Honor. All right. Okay, then starting back at the beginning of the alphabet, uh, Bountiful. Fox Elder County. Bragg. Brigham City. This is Paul Larson, I'm present. And since those other guys aren't everything, I decide for them we'll go. Okay, that's good. <laughs> Centerville. Uh, Mike Carlson, Centerville City Public Works Director. Okay. Uh, Clearfield. Clearfield, Spencer Brimley, Clearfield City Community Development Director. All right. Clinton. Daughter, a planner with Clearfield City. Okay. Peter Matson with Clinton. Davis County. Barton, I can wear two hats for Davis County. Oh, Bartley's here. His, he's muted. <laughs> You're muted, Bartley. There we go. This is Bartley Matthews with Davis County. Okay. Farmington. David Peterson with Farmington City. Far West. Root Heights, Harrisville, Glenn Gamble with Harrisville City, All right, Hill Air Force Base. Yeah, this is uh, Colonel Stromberg representing Hill Air Force Base. Great, Hooper, Hayesville. 
Layton. Mayor Hello. Joy Petro. And Joel and Grandy. And Weston and Floney. Marriott Slaterville. Maida. North Ogden. Scott Hess. And Ryan Nunn. North Salt Lake City. We have Ali Avery, Mackenzie Johnson, and Sherry Hose. Right. And Ogden, we have uh, me, Barton Brierly, and Brandon Ripien, senior player. And Perry. Oh, we got someone from Perry and Plain City. All right, great. Well, thank you everybody for coming. I hope this is uh, useful for you. Um, so we're going to start with uh, approval of the September 13th minutes. So um, the way we vote is, uh, is uh, we'll propose something. And if uh, you object, speak up. If you approve, stay quiet. So um, so I'll move unanimous approval of the September 13th, 2023 meeting minutes. Is there any um, objection to that? I don't know that you're supposed to make the motion as the chair, Barton. Yeah, it depends which rule, which uh, version of uh, Robert's rules you read. <laughs> okay, we can do that. I'll second it. All right. We'll use the loose version at this meeting. Okay. <laughs> I think they're called Bob's rules when you use the loose version. <laughs> okay. Barton's rules. All right. I I don't uh, hear any objections, so we'll consider those approved. Um, so a couple agenda notes. Um, first, uh, we're going to have a community highlight uh, here from Syracuse in just a minute. Um, I will be asking for someone else to do a uh, community highlight next month. So I just felt this uh, meeting would be useful if uh, we kind of heard what's going on in your community. If you can highlight a project you're doing or a program or something that you found success. And uh, if you found success, we'll copy or if you failed, we'll, uh, avoid doing that. So I will be asking for a volunteer for our next meeting, which will be in February. And we won't be able to leave until somebody volunteers. So uh, please somebody be ready to volunteer for a community highlight. Uh, second high note is uh, item seven on our agenda is discussion of townhomes. So my uh, expectation is this is a discussion that uh, you may have brought something that you can share on the screen of uh, a townhome project that uh, you've seen that uh, you think turned out really well or really awful or somewhere in between. So you still have some time to pull something up. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. I'm sure if you're sitting at your computer, you can probably pull one off your, your hard drive or even go to Google Earth and show us. So. I'm hoping that we'll get uh, a dozen or so people sharing a project and why you think it's good or bad. So please note that. And then um, also item 8B on the agenda is future topics. So yeah, I want this meeting to be useful for us. So if you, there's something in a future meeting that you want to discuss, you know, this townhome suggestion was something that uh, came out of a suggestion from from another meeting last month. We did uh, we had someone from Kem Gardner talk about demographics. That was a suggestion from another meeting. So, if you got topics for uh, suggestions for future topics, uh, please let us know, or you can even put those in the chat. So, with that, uh, Noah is going to share with us uh, what's going on in Syracuse. So, turn time over to you, Noah.
You're muted, Noah. Hey guys, sorry, I was on mute. Um, yeah, thanks for the opportunity uh, to share a little bit about our community. Uh, we're we're a smaller community compared to some. We're about thirty five thousand people. Uh, our slogan is that we're the gateway to Antelope Island. If you see Antelope Drive goes through the center of the community and then the gatehouse out to the Antelope Island, Great Salt Lake. So a lot of people come out that way for to recreate. Uh, our our city is kind of a tale of uh, just being a kind of a bedroom community that's growing really quickly. And as you know, we've got the West Davis Corridor under construction and uh, we're, we're trying to do everything right. Um, We've got a lot of exciting projects that have kind of came our way. Uh, you've probably heard about Costco. Uh, so that's, uh, we're hoping that it will land. It's looking good. You know, we don't, we don't have a site plan application or anything, but we've changed the zoning for it. So it's looking good so far. Um, we've been, We've been able to do a few studies uh, through the TLC program that I think have benefited. Um, but I've got on the screen here uh, something I plagiarized from Clearfield. Uh, they showed me how to do kind of this. Uh, we've got this on our website. This is all of our development projects. And if you want, we can go through a few of these. But the, um, if in case you guys were wondering, the Costco's proposed to go right here. In the corner of 3000 and antelope of course that'll be a regional project and we're excited for it um so like i said syracuse in the last um last year we've constructed a lot of multifamily, and that's made a lot of people angry um but most of those projects are located along antelope drive we, we have um uh, we have these two projects that are like the dueling apartment complexes that uh, I think have really changed the landscape. People driving through the through town uh, are used we're used to seeing a field there. But uh, this this project, uh, if you want, I, could, I mean, ten minutes goes by really fast, but I can go through over a couple of these projects that we're seeing. Uh, we we drafted a mixed use zone. There wasn't political will to just do a full apartment zone uh, but for some of these sites that have been along major arterials that were traditionally zoned for commercial uh, we knew that maybe there was a little bit of leverage to maximize the the, uh, the market demand for multifamily and squeeze out a little bit of commercial where it hadn't been so that so these mixed use projects are required to have a commercial component when we originally drafted the zone, we thought we were really imagining, you know, kind of like a vertical mixed use uh, with the first floor. But we we received a lot of pushback on that from from developers. So we ended up amending that or going away from that a little bit and allowing what we'd call like a horizontal mixed use. And so each project is required to have still required to have a commercial component but it's just it's still located within the project and like for example this one uh, had to do some office condos and they built those up front and uh, the project the the condo project was actually sold really well uh, they're almost done with this project it has uh, about 360 units it um, you know you have townhomes over here and, and apartments over here uh, there was a lot of public opposition to this. Um, I wouldn't say it turned out perfectly, but um, architecturally, uh, you know, we had a big emphasis um, to have a good street presence. And um, so that's finishing out. This was a uh, right development group. This next project ended up being a Castle Creek project. Um, and then this is a slightly smaller project uh, 250 units. Uh, so these are three story, three story walk up apartments. These ones right here have tuck under garages and these other ones just have, you know, surface parking and then some rentable garages. The commercial component of this one is an office building that they haven't built. There's actually two office buildings. One, one office building, they have it under construction. And I hear that uh, Davis Behavioral Health will locate there. But the second office building, as you know, office 
market is not great right now, uh, but we're but this this project is also nearing completion, and they both leased up successfully. The 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 critique that we've been receiving about these is that they're kind of like the high end rental product that it's not exactly affordable housing. I think uh, rents right now for a one bedroom or I want to say they're about 1500 bucks. So it's not exactly affordable housing. We have, um, you know, a lot of projects. This is another mixed use project over here that there were townhomes and then a commercial strip mall. And that's built out now. And the, the commercial portion leased up well. Um, let's see. So on a larger scale, you can see on this in the southwest corner of the of the city, we we've we've got this big project. It's a master plan community. Woodside Homes is built, and it's actually technically two subdivision. One's called Stillwater, and you see they they have these ski lakes. If you haven't been out there, it's kind of a unique kind of thing out here. Really high end homes. The one thing that turned out well with this project is you get a mixture of of housing types. You do have the large homes, but you also have the standard quarter acre and then all the way down to this uh, little 3,500 square foot lots that'll be next to the, where the freeway is going. And uh, between Stillwater and then this next project, the second master plan community project that you have to have 100 acres for, uh, you'll have over a thousand units of single family, all single family. Um, we used to have RC Willys uh, that left for Layton and in its wake, there's an, another project that has a variety of housing types. It goes from townhomes all the way to, you know, third acre lots. Um, another interesting thing with Syracuse, uh, we are getting a hospital. So up here by the high school, um, this also utilized the mixed use zone where we had, uh, they had to purchase all 50 acres from the church, they only needed about half of it. So they partnered with uh, Wasatch Residential and they're, they're building uh, some retail commercial along the frontage of 193 and also a, a apartment and townhome project. And then on the corner, they're starting their first phase is a, is emergency room, but then they'll be uh, building a, you know, a hospital similar to Ogden Regional. It's HCA is the hospital builder there. Um, but yeah, the, the city's growing. You can see we don't have time for all of the projects. Another popular project is the temple that's um, under construction. Uh, they have, you know, it's changed the skyline a little bit. Um, that'll be, I think it's another year until that's completed. Uh, yeah, is that ten minutes? I don't want to yeah. over overdo it. Um, yeah, I think but, uh, yeah. there. Yeah, that's Syracuse. A few of the things we have going on. Hopefully, that was interesting. Yeah, it was. Thank you very much. Appreciate it, Noah. Yeah, you bet. Thanks. All right. Um, so we're going to move on to discussion of the Wasatch Choice Vision, and Hugh and Ted are going to take this section. So you two go ahead. All right, thanks, Barton, and thanks, Noah, for kicking us off. <clears throat> so uh, thanks to everybody that attended our workshops uh, over the last little while. And you'll recall that a big portion of that was talking about family-friendly bicycle networks. These are some of the images that we all looked at together. Um, and we gave you, you know, a bunch of markers and maps and whatnot. And, uh, you know, we're talking about uh, the Utah Trail Network, and the Beehive Bikeways, right? That are complementary uh, networks to, to really create a premier family-friendly bicycle network, low-stress network, uh, places that provide real choice for folks uh, to get around, right? And you know, shift their, give them the potential to really shift their travel behavior and patterns. So, just wanted to give you a little bit of an insight of uh, the outcome of that. You know, the data that we got uh, and the feedback that we got. So you touch on that work. Those are the blue markers and the lines we, we asked you to put on there. And these are the lines drawn uh, throughout. I think there were three workshops uh, in the, the northern portion of the WFRC area. And you can see a, a lot of folks saying, hey, we want the state to look at this 
trail and this trail and, and maybe build this. And you recall we have those gold stars there too, those are represented by the yellow dots, you know, for people saying, hey, this trail here um, is really closer to shovel ready than not, uh, you know, has, has had some development along the way. So a lot of great input um, on that side of things. And then the, the, the green lines that we talked about, right, be a bikeway opportunities, uh, really looking at where can current facilities or planned facilities be upgraded to those family friendly, low stress, you know, protection from cars. And you can see a ton of interest in this as well, you know, across across the region and something that, that we're excited about that there's interest here and, and folks are understanding you know, how important it is, again, to provide real transportation choice by developing these types of facilities. Um, even though we know right, it's not always easy to do so. Um, if you combine them all together, you know, this great um, you know, interest and opportunity and vision for looking, you know, what, what would this family friendly network look like to get people to their everyday destinations. So um, a lot of information for us to filter through and distill and, and get back with you all. And so just Yay. as a reminder of next steps, <clears throat> on the Utah Trail Network side, these were the steps we presented in those meetings and, uh, you know, developing a potential trail list. Well, that information has been given to UDOT. And so they have a list, right, of, of projects that they think they can program sooner rather than later. Uh, again, thanks to your input. And they're reviewing that list um, right now and be reaching out to you as local communities if there's a project in there that they're interested in uh, looking more at that with you again to fund sooner rather than later and then ranking those projects uh, using their transportation investment fund active prioritization model uh, and seeing which ones come out on top so that that work will be happening uh, from this point through uh, february of 2024 uh, when some information will be presented to the transportation commission who will ultimately you know look at the rankings that are done through that prioritization model and um, assign actual program funds to projects in March of 24. And uh, projects that are selected through this, again, I'll call it the first programming cycle because it won't be the last, but through this first programming cycle, uh, there's money available now and new money available come July 1 of 24. And so these are projects that can really uh, kick off quickly once the Transportation Commission has made those has made those decisions. So where does that leave us with the uh, Beehive Bikeways? <clears throat> um, and again, complementary to the Utah Trail Network. Well, taking out the information that you all gave us, um, really refining that vision and what that looks like, uh, you know, all those lines together, um, just to just to get a, a little more, is a concrete vision a real thing? I don't know, but uh, we're gonna try and refine that a little bit over these winter months. Um, and then reach out to you all, uh, as we said we would, try and bring communities together around certain corridors or, or project opportunities through the spring and the summer. Um, make sure that right we're advancing the right the right corridors and concepts together, and then ultimately, you know, providing some implementation resources um, along you know after we we get to those um, those projects that that can uh, be part of this. Uh, in the summer and fall. And again, just really trying to advance this idea of a legitimate uh, family-friendly cycling network that gets um, you know, to the majority of folks, gets them to everyday destinations and makes them safe and comfortable on, on low stress facilities. So uh, really excited about this. Again, appreciate uh, y'all's interest and we'll be in touch. If, if there's anybody that has questions, uh, whether it's on the Utah Trail Network <clears throat> or on Beehive Bikeways, you know, before we happen to reach out or you don't happen to reach out, whatever the case may be, feel free to reach out uh, to myself or any member at WFRC who will probably just refer you to me anyway, uh, but you can reach out to anybody and we're happy to discuss um, ideas and whatnot uh, with you beyond what we discussed in the workshops. And I'll, I'll just put my email and phone number in the chat as soon as I'm done here. Uh, but with that, uh, Barton, I think I'm done unless there are any specific questions. Uh, on this topic for me. Any questions out there? Awesome. Thanks for the time. Thank you, Hugh. All right, let's move to Ted. Okay. Thanks, Barton. Um, and thanks, Hugh, for that. Uh, so I think you all know that the Wasatch Choice Vision 
which incorporates the regional transportation plan. It was adopted by a council represented by, you know, a lot of your mayors and county commissioners um, just in last May. And what I'm about to do is tell you uh, some of the initial ideas for where we go this planning cycle. It's a four-year planning cycle. Um, and in doing this, I feel a little bit like a school teacher who on the, you know, the first month of summer vacation is giving the reading list for the next year. So, you know, forgive me for that. I understand, you know, we just got done with the last vision, but it takes a little time for us collectively to kind of, you know, jump into interesting new conversations, pieces of analysis that meet our shared needs. So that's the idea is um, get your feedback. Now I'm gonna share with you a document and you have full uh, rights to go ahead and ask questions, make suggestions in this document. Go ahead. I hope I shared it correctly. Let me tell you about these five ideas that we have. Looking ahead, we develop collaboratively with you over the next few years. I think you all know when we talk about Wasatch Choice, that's kind of a royal we uh, framework. It's a framework for uh, where you want to go with your communities, where do you want to create city and town centers, especially focus growth. Um, it also incorporates your local transportation ideas as much as we can. And it's the story of how those correlate, integrate with regional infrastructure changes over time. That's the story of Wasatch Choice. But when you hear that, think, yeah, I own that just as much as WFRC. That's what I hope that you will think. Point one, you see it there. Um, we're thinking it's time to revise the overall Wasatch Choice framework. Here's the why for that. It's because most city councilors in communities today, they don't have their fingerprints on it. Um, because the conversation that involved elected officials about, you know, things like where, what type of city and town centers is actually eight years old. And uh, there's huge turnover, as you know, in city councils over that time frame. So we're thinking, let's get back to uh, refreshing that. We can do it succinctly. Um, high level, but sub bullets under that, ABC. You may recall, we've talked about this idea of a Wasatch Choice Great Streets concept. Basically, put another way, can we adjust our planning for transportation for roads, both local and regional roadways, so that they better fit the context you want to create and vice versa? Can we match those up? A. B. Let's explore together. Are, is there a need or an appetite for cross municipality? planning and visioning around parks and public spaces. Trails could be. Um, C, let's look carefully at implementation progress of centers. The reason why is, you may know this, I think you do, we base the transportation plan on what you say you want to explore and do in the land use vision. So it affects investment. And because it affects investment, we need to do a check-in with you. Is this where you want to go? That's one. Item two, um, Hugh talked about this idea of a Beehive Bikeways family-friendly network, a vision of the network we want to achieve. You remember, by the way, his next steps were not just about the vision. It was vision. Let's talk about corridors, and then let's start to implement it. It's the idea of a vision is just a first step for implementation. But item two is hey, this might be a great time for us to just be aspirational, a bit more aspirational for all modes, for the kind of roadway network we want to create and change over time for public transportation and for active transportation. That's item two. Item three, um, we use this phrase external forces. And what I mean by that is things that are difficult for us all to control. COVID-19, swings in the economy, um, rapid technological shift, connected and autonomous vehicles, climate change, things that we don't have great control over, 
Well, what do they mean? What do they mean for how people get around? What do they mean for land development? What do they mean for regional entities? What do they mean for you uh, as local governments? How can we, even though we can't totally control, we can actually shape them a little bit, or we can take advantage of opportunities and mitigate challenges. That's that item, continue in external forces and policies exploration. I hope that you are you will be involved in that and we'll talk through that um, and about what that might mean together. Item four, public stakeholder and process enhancements. We wanna have more visibility, clarity about openings that, that residents can put forward their ideas or comment on the plan. Um, item five, um, issues. Understand issues, shared implications, ways to shape things like water, how transportation and land use together help you know, workers get to business sites, that access to opportunities item, and C, induce demand. Sometimes when we create new capacity, it changes how people get around, and that can sometimes, you know, not help us achieve the, the benefits that we thought we would get, let's say congestion reduction. We wanna understand that better. That's not an exhaustive list. That's aiming to say, hey, what might we add on to the core things that we do as a regular matter? But this is an initial draft. That's why it says it on the page. And if you have thoughts, ideas, questions, or you simply just wanna be meaningfully involved as this conversation occurs, over developing the game plan for the next four years. We would love that. And uh, Barton, I'm gonna hand it back to you. If you wanna facilitate any conversation on this, I would love to hear it. Otherwise, would love to have you mark this up in the ways that uh, you would like to. Okay, anybody have comments? I'm gonna try to add something right in the draft here. Need oh, to discuss. Man, Housing density and changing retail patterns. Oh yeah, <laughs> that's great. Perfect. Uh, and way to model exactly what to do. <laughs> Thanks everybody. All right. Anyone feel free to keep, uh, there's chat in there. You can add ideas or you can add them directly in the document there. Barton, one thing oh, I add. never shared my screen like an idiot. So anyway, sorry about that. I meant to share my screen. Sorry, as you were. Barton, I just put in the um, the chat. One thing on top of what Ted was mentioning with the revisiting the centers and, and working with their communities is um, the general uh, plan data. So we compiled that in 2020. Um, we want to... Uh, update that next year with you all. And so um, take a look at the, the link that I just put in the chat and um, be prepared for us to kind of reach out and update that. Because that direct feed, we, we did um, a couple years ago, line up the center boundaries um, with the general, the general future land use layer. Um, but, you know, as that changes, then it, it kind of trickles down too, so. Um, just added that to it. All right, uh, we're going to jump to Miranda. You're going to talk about uh, legislative preview. All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks uh, for letting me share a little bit. Um, give me one moment. All right. So I'm really excited about the opportunity to share with you guys a little bit more about the upcoming 2024 uh, legislative session. Um, it's coming up quickly. The legislature will start on uh, January 16th and runs through March 1st of this year. The session runs for about 45 days. Well, about it runs for 45 days and is the shortest legislative session in the country. So we're prepping right now to cram all of that busy lawmaking and tracking and all that into those quick 45 days. And so uh, I kind of want to give a little bit 
a background and maybe where we're coming from, where we're headed and, and what to kind of expect going into this session. I will note that we're coming off of a number of years, about maybe three or four years of significant state surplus and then significant um, investment into multimodal transportation. Uh, like you mentioned, the Utah Trail Network and the funding that was um, given last year for the Active Transportation <laughs> Investment Fund. Um, there's, you know, over the past several years, there's been uh, significant one-time funding for specific transit projects like the double tracking and front runner. Um, generally, the legislature's put in billions and billions of dollars year after year uh, with, with this significant surplus for transportation. And um, while that may uh, may change a bit based on some of the, um, the legislative landscape, which I'll get into now, um, we still we still can see the legislature continuing to uh, support multimodal transportation. So I want to touch on these uh, things a little bit um, and how it will impact maybe the session and some of the things that are being considered. Um, I mentioned ex uh, pretty substantial surplus uh, the last several years. This year, we're seeing those numbers to be much smaller and a bit more modest than in years past. So last year, while the legislature was looking at ongoing and one-time um, surpluses of you know three or two billion dollars, um, now we're looking at uh, uh, I don't have my numbers in front of me, but about five hundred million dollars for ongoing funding, and I think it was around one hundred fifty million for. Um, one-time funding. So pretty big, significant difference and which impacts really what the legislature can, can fund this upcoming year. And so that will definitely um, play into things. Uh, second is that there's new House leadership this year. So um, Speaker Mike Schultz is the new Speaker of the House. Um, uh, Speaker Schultz was a former member of the Wasatch Front Regional Council um, and has been a really great um, advocate for multimodal transportation funding over the past several years. And we hope he continues to, to do that in his new role. Um, but ultimately, that, that new leadership dynamic may shake some things up a little bit. And so we're, we're interested to see how that, how that kind of plays out in the, the House of Representatives. Um, second is that right now, and this shouldn't be a surprise to anyone, but the 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 key message and the key focus of the legislature um, now is housing, right? So um, housing affordability, housing attainability. Um, it's the big focus right now, which is um, also the focus of the governor's budget, which I'll touch on briefly. Um, and then lastly, and most excitingly, is this, uh, the upcoming uh, 20, 2034 Olympic Games in Salt Lake City. Um, Salt Lake City being named the preferred host really is a, um, it's, it's a great way for legislators to, um, to help plan for and prepare for the games. And that might mean things like additional funding for infrastructure and transportation and transit. And the games is going to be on their minds, not just now while it's kind of fun and exciting news, but over the next 10 years, I think it will definitely be um, something that shapes um, the way the legislature invests in, in what it does. So I'll quickly run through a few highlights from the governor's budget. Um, he released his budget recommendations for fiscal year 2025 yesterday and the day before. Um, primarily the budget was focused around um, housing affordability, specifically starter homes. So um, homes for first time home buyers, um, and different um, interventions or grants or uh, subsidies to enable uh, more starter homes to be built um, to cater to Utah's population who currently cannot afford the median home price. Um, and then in addition to starter homes and affordable housing was also a priority around uh, homelessness, which he kind of unveiled on Monday at his first part of his budget release. But I kind of want to focus on the um, the top three 
bullets, which are for transportation related um, recommendations. The first being 45 million um, ongoing for public transportation investment. This is a um, this is a recommendation to move 1% of the state, state sales tax going into the transit invest, sorry, the transportation investment fund or the TIF and transfer that 1% into the transit transportation investment fund. So um, this would ultimately provide, continue to provide additional long-term stable funding for transit projects throughout the state um, in that TTIF fund, which is really exciting. And um, this will likely be one of our, um, one of the, the asks that we're, you know, we're supportive of this session and, uh, and we'll look towards, you know, advocating for. Um, second and third are the 2.5 million transit innovation grants. Um, this was an idea out of the Unified Economic Opportunity Commission, or the UEOC, um, to provide um, grants which would require a match uh, to local communities to um, provide certain types of transit service to enhance their existing transit service. So some ideas for this were um, K through 12 pass programs for students and their families. Um, similar to what um, Salt Lake City is already doing. Um, other ideas were shuttle service to uh, high capacity areas. And then um, lastly is that 1.5 million uh, and 400,000 ongoing for advanced air mobility. Um, so this would be a request for, um, that would benefit the Utah Department of Transportation in their efforts to plan for advanced air mobility. Um, so I kind of touched on housing a little bit, uh, homelessness. There was also money, uh, significant funding in there for outdoor recreation and open space. And then again, for water, which continues to be a, a priority for the governor and his administration. So lots of good things in the, in the governor's budget. And now that that's out there and proposed, the legislature will then take these recommendations and ultimately decide if their priorities align with what the governor has proposed and um, we'll get started on session. I do want to note uh, just a few helpful resources for you all if you want to stay uh, attuned to the conversation and are interested in engaging and what might be happening up on Capitol Hill. Um, this is kind of a screenshot of our uh, government affairs webpage. If you um, go to the public involvement um, tab, you'll find our government affairs page where you can find our bill tracker. Um, our bill tracker will kind of um, give brief summaries of, of relevant bills and legislation, um, share uh, WFRC's uh, position on the bill tracker. So opposed, supportive, neutral. Um, those recommendations come from our council. Um, and then um, ultimately we'll give, you know, up-to-date information about where those bills are at, if they've passed, if they're um, still in the process. We also have our appropriations tracker um, that lists out where uh, proposed appropriations are like that of the governor's budget, other appropriations from various stakeholders or partners um, or legislative requests. And we'll go through it and show where they're at in the process, if they've been prioritized or ranked by legislative appropriation committees. Um, what they're, you know, being funded amount, what their funding amounts are, and if they're ultimately included in the final appropriation bills. So while both of these tools aren't quite like full and robust right now, because we're still a little uh, early before session starts, as session gets going, um, we hope they're a, a helpful uh, resource and tool for you all to, to track what's going on. Um, earlier today, someone asked about, you know, other um, bill trackers and things like that. Our partners at the Utah League of Cities and Towns has a bill tracker that I'd recommend you guys um, tracking as well. Um, I'd say our, our positions, you know, we work with the Utah League of Cities and Towns regularly, as well as the Utah Association of Counties, UDOT, UTA, Mountain Land Association of Governments, and um, you know, work with them and uh, get their feedback on bills as well to help develop our bill recommendations and positions. Um, but the league and others might have may have different positions than we do um, on some bills. 
And then lastly, uh, our government affairs email list. Um, this morning, I sent out a government affairs update um, to that mailing list, outlining some of those things in the governor's budget, what they mean and, and the impact of them. Um, and I send those out regularly, but during session, even more regularly, about once a week. And so if you're interested in knowing what's happening up on the Hill and kind of tracking these areas of you know transportation, air quality, housing affordability, economic development, as it relates to the Wasatch Choice Vision and the work we do here at WFRC, um, please let me know. And I'm always happy to answer questions um, You know, in real time as we're going through the session. Always feel free to reach out to me. We love your feedback as well. Um, if there are certain bills or appropriations that you are supportive of or um, concerned about or interested in, we love hearing everyone's expertise. Um, so that we can better effectively um, analyze the legislation and make sure that we're making informed decisions. So never hesitate to reach out with um, with any input. So uh, with that, I'd you know be happy to answer any questions and just appreciate everyone's time. Yeah. Looks like we had a, a question in the chat. I don't know if you can read that one. Let's see. Jay, was slash is there a lessons learned document from the previous uh, legacy strategies, long-term maintenance, et cetera, and the Olympics in general with regard to transportation and housing in particular? Jay, maybe you're talking, I think you're talking specifically about the Olympics. Um, I don't know that I have the right answer on this. I don't know if any of our um, friends uh, might be able to answer that question if anyone on the call might have a good answer for that. I do know that UTA has put together a pretty, um, they've done a really great presentation before at their Transit Academy earlier this year, where they shared um, some of those lessons learned from the Olympics um, in 2022, sorry, 2002. And um, shared kind of the best practices that they used to accomplish what needed to be done. I recall them talking about like they um, brought in bus drivers and transit drivers from all over the country because we needed that um, those those bodies to, to drive all the transit um, here. So Jay, I think there's probably, there probably is a lot of lessons learned. I'm not the one to share that, but uh, if anyone from UTA wants to jump in, feel free. Hi, this is Michelle Larson. We do have a bunch of materials left over from the 2002 Olympics. If there's something specific, I would just encourage you to reach out and we'll see what we can do to accommodate your request. My email address is mlarsen at rideuta.com. Thanks, Michelle. Um, and then I saw one more question asking if the 45 million in transit funding is ongoing. And yes, that's that is ongoing. So um, the 45 million is an estimate because it's um, a portion of uh, sales tax revenue. So that will change or fluctuate year to year. But the estimate for FY25 was $45 million ongoing. Hey, thank you very much, Miranda. Appreciate it. Thanks, Barton. So uh, we're going to talk about urban design machine learning, Brent. Hello. Let me share here. Great. Oh, I actually need to share with audio just a sec. Okay, there we go. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Brent Chamberlain. I, I teach in landscape architecture and environmental planning at Utah State. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about a project we've been working on that was funded by the National Science Foundation. And as part of that, we had to make a marketing video to sort of promote what we do, but I think it's a good lead in and um, to this discussion to kind of get you thinking about what it is that we do. Um, we really focus on building AI tools and machine learning to um, conduct data collection analysis related to um, accessibility for people with disabilities. So with that, I will run the video. Hi, my name is Brent Chamberlain. I'm an associate professor at Utah State University and the principal investigator for our team, Universal Pathways. 
Nearly 30 million working age Americans live with disabilities and face significant challenges accessing employment due to the lack of transportation infrastructure. Despite efforts to improve these conditions, an adequate knowledge of infrastructural issues have led to communities facing hundreds of millions of dollars in lawsuits. At Universal Pathways, we believe good data about the accessibility of public transit, crosswalks, sidewalks, and public rights away is essential for building thriving communities. Good data leads to more informed planning strategies, better strategies increase equitable access to employment, better public health and safety, and reduces the likelihood for legal action. Our solutions can help communities prioritize infrastructural decisions decisions to improve access to places of employment. At Universal Pathways, a distinguished team of computer science researchers, human service professionals, and community planning experts join forces to develop cutting-edge urban analytics. Our team consists of individuals from nationally recognized institutions throughout the U.S., spanning expertise across seven distinct disciplines. Collectively, our team has worked with dozens of communities locally and throughout the world to improve infrastructure planning. Together, we have received several millions of dollars in funding for our research and efforts. Our approach leverages state-of-the-art computer vision and machine learning. This approach is improved by working people living with disabilities who provide essential validation and quality control reviews. Our prototype currently detects transit stop and sidewalk infrastructure with high accuracy. Our prototype has been built to be extremely scalable and expandable to a range of different locations throughout the U.S. and we can detect a range of elements to facilitate transportation, movement and planning. Our techniques will be easy to deploy anywhere that imagery such as Google Street View exists. These techniques do not require expensive aerial or LiDAR imagery, painstaking crowdsourcing or extensive on-site manual inventories. Our final data are packaged into easy to use geographic data sets. Further, we can provide analytics that incorporate demographic and other built environment variables important for community planners. An online inventory tool would have been so beneficial as a planner when conducting the stop inventory and checking for accessibility. This type of tool would make it easier to analyze and share data resources to help with improvements to make locations more accessible in a timely manner. Over 80% of communities do not have an ADA transition plan mandated by the federal government and so the pressure to deliver is increasing. Universal Pathways provides rapid and cost-efficient solutions to build ADA transition plans. Urban centers will clearly benefit from our approach, but ours is the first to be highly scalable to suburban and rural communities where these data are normally cost prohibitive to maintain. Planners are not the only professionals who can benefit from partnering with Universal Pathways. Transportation agencies, developers, service professionals, and mobility managers are among many of the professions that can use data provided and monitored by Universal Pathways. At Universal Pathways, we are motivated to improve independence, access to employment, and social integration. People with disabilities deserve to thrive in our communities. By partnering with Universal Pathways, you can help create safer, more accessible transportation while simultaneously mitigating non-compliance costs. Join us in supporting Universal Pathways. Together, let's build a better future, connected and inclusive mobility networks for all. Hi, my name is Brent Chamberlain. You're muted, Brent. It's better that way if I talk less. <laughs> um, since the video has, uh, since we we shared the video with NSF and the networks um, within there, we've continued to develop this out. So I'm just giving you an, an a reference idea of some of the features that we're able to identify and then develop into um, geospatial data sets. So things like identification of crosswalks, textured curb ramps, as well as um, non-textured curb ramps, and by default, the, the identification if the curb ramp does not exist. Um, other sorts of obstacles and, and bus stop shelters and signage and those sorts of things. And what you see on the right is um, sort of a, a generalized accuracy metric with how well we're able to detect those features. This uses Google Street View imagery as well as some other kind of images that have been collected over time. Uh, as sort of a first pass to asset management related transportation. Um, we certainly can expand this into other types of topics, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, before we go there, I because these are data that we use in GIS, I just wanted to get a quick take on how many of you 
um, know about the existing GIS data. So if you go to chat, I just put a link in there um, to a survey that will just, I'm just curious to gauge if your awareness of, of these kind of data. I think I think we should clarify that that doesn't mean you just found out about it. <laughs> so it's interesting because when we did this meeting earlier today, it was you know quite a different um, quite a different setting. Uh, I think there was a disproportionate amount of of higher of people responding that that identified they had higher amount of data. I think this is actually more accurate to what we found in our own research um, nationally, certainly even even locally. Um, they're just we just tend not to have good good data about this. So I'll I'll move on. Um, you can feel free to keep putting that in if you want. I also wanted to, to introduce what this transition plan is. I think many of you may be aware, but um, I think there's a a lot of uh, of a lot of folks that don't know about specific plans, uh, these types of plans. So transition plans are required by federal government for public entities serving more than fifty employees. Um, and they relate to the ADA regulations that came out several decades ago. An ADA transition plan has four different key components to it. So the first is that identification of the physical obstacles. So these are uh, primarily nowadays we're seeing these in sort of geospatial data sets, right? So that we know where those things are that limit accessibility to the different um, public entities facilities. Um, and that can be, you know, even even other, you know, pu not public facilities, just as buildings, but broadly when we think about facilities and then the kinds of methods that that will be implemented to make those facilities accessible and the scheduling and sort of budgetary kinds of issues um, to address that, as well as who is it that re is responsible for that within that community. Um, and typically what we're seeing is so many of these plans aren't developed because we don't have the kind of data um, to identify those physical obstacles. So why does this, this matter? There are a few um, points I'm indicating here, but I want to call a couple out. So one is that um, non-compliance non is actually just discriminatory in general, outside of the fact that it can lead to lawsuits and uh, it can be difficult to get some federal funding, right? There's a, a whole, uh, in, in Utah, I think it's roughly 20, 22% of citizens have a disability. Um, so this is a group that um, is pretty substantial within our, our population. It's like that nationally. It's actually higher nationally. Uh, one of the things that's really important that I want to get across here to look up these pro -Ag standards. So the Pedestrian Rights of Way Accessibility Guide. This is from the U.S. Access Board, highest, highest level uh, federal agency that deals with um, public rights of way and the policies. They just released this in August of this year. And this is kind of a new push to emphasize the importance of developing plans and compliance. So I would highly recommend that, not just because it speaks to what we do, but certainly there's relationship to that. But more importantly, just to address some of the issues that may be coming up within uh, transportation planning in the community. So that said, now that I've indicated a little bit of the transportation plan, you can go back to that same link. Um, and here's the next question. Does your community have an ADA transition plan? And as a lot of um, the answers that are popping up are either no or I don't know. Can you remind the group if um, TLC funds can help support ADA transition plans. Julie, did you say Ted? I didn't. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I was just noticing that everyone who's answering this question is saying either no or I don't know. And so I was wondering well, um, if TLC could help communities with an ADA transition plan. I think this, this is an eligible project idea. And uh, 
if a community wanted to put this forward and look for some funding from TLC, I think you could absolutely make that request. And the basic question is, does it help, um, you know, enable people to get around in other ways, uh, uh, which it sounds like it certainly would. Yeah, that's right. And we'll come back to that um, in another slide here in, in just a little bit. The statistics we're seeing here are what we're seeing across the country. In fact, I think it's about 15% of communities in the U.S. have an ADA transition plan. The request has been out there for three decades, and that's why this pro standard standard's so important, because they're starting to emphasize something needs to be done about this now. Um, all right. So one of the important applications here, oh, I'll, I'll just back up and show this group. We've got just 30 more seconds. We're developing a prototype that sort of gives you a dashboard, right, of, of kind of the data you can see from sidewalks and network to specific sorts of scores. So how many curb ramps do I actually have that are accessible? What, what sort of the bus stop amenity scores? And then be able to look at different images and locations throughout a community to identify the kinds of infrastructure that RAI system has detected. Um, while this project through NSF was focused on disability and they had sort of this bent towards employment as well, this is broader than just those that are of working age and disability. So the kinds of technology that we're talking about here and the way we implement this is applicable to all these other different points. So, you know, walkability projects, I want to call it like safe routes to schools. I myself have witnessed several kids flying face first onto the pavement on scooters and bikes and otherwise because of the quality of sidewalks or missing curb ramps or those sorts of things. Um, and even generally just a broad uh, talking about asset management, right? The different kinds of transit systems and infrastructure and signage and those sorts of things. So there are other options as you're thinking about how could this apply? What kind of funding could we potentially get to work with this? Um, we'd be happy to explore those other options. Um, we're interested in trying to find partners to work with communities that we can develop these kinds of, and you know, uh, should say case studies. So there's certainly federal agencies. Grant matching is actually really useful. So um, we're going to be pushing this through with a, a U-Track project through UDOT and having matching, um, in particular, if we can get multiple communities involved in this. The scale of economy is really good with AI uh, techniques because most of the cost is gathering the imagery and training the kind of data that we need. So the more that we can get on there, the, the cheaper it will end up becoming. Um, that said, I just want to put a survey here. I will, I'll copy this and put it into the link. Um, this is just a quick internal Qualtrics survey. Uh, it should be done in just a couple of minutes. We'll send it back out later as well, um, just to get your name information. And if you want us to reach back out and other potential ways we can collaborate. Um, I'm open to questions if, if folks um, have any points of clarification. Okay, do we have uh, questions for Brent? Okay, well, that was super uh, helpful. I appreciate that. Of course, hey, hey, yeah. Hey, hey uh, Barton, or um, I just wanted you to know, um, I just put the uh, el program eligibility for TLC projects in the chat and it very well may fit into that. So I just wanted you guys to have that uh, link as well. So, sorry, I was trying to figure out how to do that on my phone. Great project. <laughs> Thank okay. you, thanks. All right, great. Thank you, Brent. Appreciate that. Yeah, thank you all. All right, we're going to move to Julie and our favorite topic, the Parking Modernization Guide. Okay, thanks, Barton. So we're back with the Utah Parking Modernization Guide. Hopefully you all on this call were, um, were blessed or, or whatever the word is to see Barton, Brad, and myself talk at ULCT or TED. Um, and Barton and Brad talk at APA this last conference season. Um, I just wanted to remind everyone that a few months ago, uh, W4C with the Regional Transportation Planning uh, Agencies released a Utah Parking Modernization Guide. Um, reminder, you know, the world has changed. We have different dynamics now and how mobile we are and how we use our urban spaces um, and so this guidebook is trying to help you rethink parking for this this sort of changed world 
um, think about context within your communities and how those different contexts might change parking um, throughout your your community. So this guidebook is is here to help think through those um, those questions. So um, one thing that has put Utah on the map is our multi-level marketing. So I'm going to steal um, the framework from Young Living to get you guys excited about parking. So much like Essential Oils is asking you to join their community. I'm asking you to join our community in terms of parking. There's So there's no better time than now to take your, um, your community's future, your parking future into your own hands. And so no matter what your goal is, we want you to know that that's possible. And so WPRC is here to help support you in um, three different ways. The first is um, start sharing these ideas with your planning commission and your city council. WFRC is here if you would like us to present to either one of those um, boards to help get that conversation started. Um, we also can ex help explore your parking ordinance through WFRC's parking assistance and auditing program. This is a no cost program. There's no match needed um, to look at those parking ordinances and see where um, some of them might be outdated or where we can improve context within your parking ordinance. And then third, um, we have technical assistance through TLC to help, again, think about your, your parking codes or your approach to parking, um, you know, make sure you have shared parking in there, whatever it is. Um, WFRC is here to help in these, these three ways. Also, next year is 2024, in case you haven't heard. And I got some taglines for you. Parking, like you've never seen before. Is the year to modern or... Improve your city's core. All of these things can be done through um, re-looking re at your parking and seeing are there ways to improve um, this ordinance, which may seem boring, but which actually has huge impacts on your city's livability, your tax revenues, how people are getting around your community. Um, to help that 2024 being the year of the parking, WFRC and others are coming up with some technical trainings, some um, webinars, for local communities, parking mobile tours, which I promise you will be more exciting than that title, um, trainings with your planning commissioner and city councils, and then information sharing. We're also asking that if you, um, like Ogden or Clearfield, have made changes to your approach to parking, if you would share those with us, we'd like to do some information sharing on our, our parking website um, so that they can be resources for other communities who are interested in thinking about um, this topic. And to kick us off with those webinars, we are hosting a webinar, I guess, already next week, um, Parking 2.0, Using Modern Parking Approaches to Maximize Community Benefits. It's a conversation with Ted, myself, and Mayor Shepard from Clearfield. This parking webinar is aimed towards your elected officials, your mayors, your city councils, um, to get them excited about thinking through these topics, to share what Clearfield has um, experienced and learned through their um, work that they've been doing on this topic. And uh, I will drop a link for the registration in the chat after I'm done, but it's next Thursday at noon. Um, mountain time, if anyone <laughs> is considering traveling, don't forget it's noon mountain time. Um, so that's all I have, Barton. I don't know if anyone has any questions. I put in the chat, the link to the guidebook. And of course, you know, reach out to Ted, myself, anyone on TLC, if your community is interested in exploring um, conversations or audits or work products in this realm. Okay, there was a comment, uh, question. Oh yeah, I didn't see it. Okay, any insight into the of parking suit? Yeah, so this, um, the parking guide is not necessarily just in areas that have transit. We are right now um, working on a parking, study that's aimed towards specifically transit stations. But the things within the, the guidebook should be applicable throughout your community. Um, even without transit service, uh, there are places in your community, I guarantee you, that are overparked, that have an excess of, of parking that's not being utilized, that could be utilized in some other way, whether that's housing, new restaurants, park space, community gathering spaces. Um, and so don't let the absence of transit service deter you from thinking through uh, this idea. And Paul is like the um, uh, 
really good basketball player asking for thoughts on how to, you know, uh, post up for a rebound. He uh, he knows a lot of this already. And Paul, you know as well as anybody that um, look, we have to meet parking demands just about everywhere in Utah, but we can meet them with different kinds of tools and we can try to maximize the utility of the spaces that are provided. And I mean, even in a, even in a city like mine in North Salt Lake, uh, which um, doesn't have great transit service there, the demand is not uniform household to household. And I, I was having this interesting um, debate or chat with another city councilor just today. And I was noting that, you know, in most metro areas, people with lots of cars, they look at areas that aren't heavily parked and they think, maybe that's not the place I'm gonna rent. And they stay away from that. And then the converse can happen. And so over time, it can be a little uncomfortable, but over time there tends to be a sorting geographically uh, for people based on how much they need or don't need parking. But I mean, really anywhere in Utah, we're gonna have some parking demand we gotta deal with. I don't know, what. how does that hit you, Paul? Or what, are, what other thoughts do you have to add on that? Yeah, I think I think I and we absolutely have areas in Brigham City that are overparked. Um, we we tried. If you've ever asked Walmart to cut down on the amount of parking they propose in their site plan, it's an exercise in other futility. We we know they're overparked. But on the other hand, in residential settings, we have situations where cars are. Um, you know, essentially clogging the street and uh, developers who would be happy to eliminate parking from their projects, I understand that that uh, some of that would tend to self-sort over time, but um, I just, I wonder for, I mean, we have, I guess in Brigham City, what, what, would probably best be described as as um, bare bones transit service. It's really transit service for those who have literally no other option. And even for them, it's not um, tremendously useful. So in that setting, um, what kind of parking standards make sense in order to avoid over parking, but at the same time, um, meet the needs that, that we have. And, and I asked that question not knowing the answer. Um, we're, we're just about to embark on a new general plan mm -hmm. update and, and we'll follow that with uh, an overhaul of our land use code. So the timing's good to be exploring this topic. Okay. And Julie, you missed, uh, instead of party like it's 1999, you should have been parking like it's 2024. Uh, this is why group think is always better than an individual. Um, if I ever give this presentation again, I'll add that one as as a tagline. But it rhymes, it sounds better than parking. What did I do? Parking? That was good. <laughs> the third one, the second one was a little rough. 2024 is the year to modern. It doesn't really rhyme. It's also a, a weird word, so I'm going to, I'll change it to, what is it? Parking like <laughs> it's like 2024. It's, parking like it's 2024, yep. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. That Julie. was the base side of one of Prince's records, by the way. <laughs> okay, so we're going to go to townhomes, but first let me jump, let me skip a little bit here and go to the eight. Um, do we have a volunteer for the February community highlight? Who have we had before already? We've Mark. had uh, Davis County, uh, Ogden, and now Syracuse. So we've got a long list of people that haven't done it. February 14th. Yes. 
um, we we could do it. Well, Brigham City could could do it. With All right. Another a really sexy presentation. Paul, All right. I think it'll be well unless it's switched. I believe it's the twenty first. Usually the third first? Wednesday. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but I like um, it better on Valentine's Day with yeah. free chocolate for everyone. Yeah, I love chocolates. All right. and what time would it be at? Two o'clock. Yeah. Two p.m. Okay. On the twenty-first. Right. We should be. Um, Jordan should be sending out the twenty twenty-four calendar invites to everybody. Um, once we get the dates locked down, so I'd expect to see those. Um, All right. Shortly. Yeah. I'll, unless somebody else wants to do it, I'll I'll plan on a Brigham City presentation. All right. Thank you, Paul. I appreciate it. And we'll, we'll maybe we'll talk about parking. Hey, I'm for it. So, all right, uh, let's talk about uh, townhomes. So, um, the good, the bad, and the ugly. I'll start out, and I hope this uh, works. Let's see if I can share a screen here. Maybe I can get rid of that. All right. So I just found a couple that uh, one that this one, this is a simple townhome project, but uh, every time people say one they like, they point out this project. And it's, it's pretty simple. It's right along a, a major road. Um, people kind of like the architecture. One thing we demand is that you cannot face your uh, front door towards a parking lot. You've got a front towards the street. And so see all these have uh, front doors that face the street. And I think that ends up being very attractive for people. Um, and then this is the interior layout of it. You see the the dry the garages face each other, and then you have these interior corridors where the front doors face each other. So it creates a little community space there. And on these two end ones, they front a little bit of a green space there. So um, that's one that people tend to comment positively about. Um, and then here's one that I just do not like at all. Um, you can see they they do the same thing. They front it on the street, which we require. Um, but they do have some open space. I know they went to um, water efficient landscaping, but it's all just rock. And you look in the back, it, I don't know, it just seems out of proportion to me. And you know your your play area is just rock with the obligatory utility cabinet there, and you know the back is just parking. And uh, Barton, these do look like they're about to fall over. Yes. <laughs> so yeah. So that's my ugly example um, of one. So do other people have anything to share? Even if you can pull up a Google image, a Google street view or something. Martin, so the rule that you have is that the front door always has to face, oh, it can't face the driveway. Uh, around the corner from me, they build these townhomes and the the bat, the driveway is on, onto the road. So even though there's a row of houses that you know is across the street, they're now facing the garages. Um, because the the front door is like interior to the site. Is do you have anything in your your ordinances or whatever that prevents like the driveway only? So there's no there's no door on the street side. It's just the driveway. Yeah, we require the front door face the street. Okay. You can't you can't have the side of the building face the street or anything like that. And it's it's tricky for people to lay out sometimes, but. They usually get it. I have a couple of projects in Brigham City I could show you that, that kind of contrast. 
Um, yeah, please do. Yeah, let me pull up the uh, screen here. Um, can you see that? Yes. Okay, so this is a project at the north end of Main Street on Brigham City that sits on what was uh, a nine hole golf course when I first moved here in, in the 1900s. Um, and um, it, this is the first project we've had that I really can point to and say, I think this is what we've been after for a long time when it comes to higher density and uh, townhouses, especially in that, that it does a lot of what you just referenced with, um, with the, um, this is, uh, is that coming up or do you yes. still see the site plan? So this is a visionary homes uh, project. This is what the elevations will look like when it's done. Um, back to the site plan, uh, all of the townhouse units, these are all townhouse units. And then uh, these are single family uh, detached units. And then there's a fair amount of, of open space and common area in there. But all of the townhouse units, like you say, they front on either green space or public space. In, in this case, these front on what will be a public uh, park. Well, same here, these units front on, on what will be green space. Um, they're all back loaded. Uh, parking is in the back and accessed by alleys. So we're kind of reintroducing some alleys to Brigham City. Uh, the units down here in phase one are, are under construction right now. They're actually starting to take shape. So that's moving forward. Um, <clears throat> the project that, that has been kind of a disappointment for us is this one. Um, that, and the reason it's a disappointment is not the density or anything else. It's this was completely approved and entitled about two and a half years ago, and it still sits there with without a shovel of dirt having been turned yet. And so when I hear complaints about we won't approve density or we won't allow density, yada, yada, I, I have probably three projects in Brigham City I can point to to say there, there's a whole lot more to that story than what you hear in the legislature, and this is one of them. Uh, this is a, a townhouse project that um, is fully approved today. Uh, the units are, um, you know, uh, that's what they look like. But for whatever reason, the developer has not acted on it at all. So anyway, those are two examples in Brigham City. Right. And just to do the the numbers I ran, we have uh, the number of dwelling units we have that are either approved but not built or under construction, not finished. Um, we're just under 4,000. But Paul, in the one that you just showed, those dry, those, will you put that back up, the, the site yes. plan for the one you just showed? Um, <laughs> I'll have to go. I just closed out. Oh, yeah. you just closed everything. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Because yeah. it just looked like the internal, like they were backing up onto the main corridor, right? To the street. Yeah, like they, they have their, so it, it's set up so that the access is a private drive. Uh, it sort of circulates off of one public street and onto another public street. And, and the access into the garages is, is in the front of the structure. They're, you know, and, and we it's a fairly tight site, so it would be hard to to design it so it's backloaded. Um, and so I, I think this one, as built, if it ever gets built, would still be a, a fairly attractive um, project. But I think the, the visionary homes one is going to be much much more attractive, and and for the residents, it's going to feel much more like a community. Okay. Anybody else have something to share? Come on. I do. Uh, this, All right, Doug, go this, ahead. This is who? Oh, this is Bartley. Go for it. 
<laughs> okay. Hey, well, thanks, I got, Dave. I got, two after, I got two after you're done. Okay. Well, I this is Bartley with Davis County. I just had a quick question because I've heard, for example, the Utah League of Cities and Towns communicating that there's, you know, over 100,000 entitled uh, units out there. So when when you say, for example, Barton, that you've got 4,000 in Ogden City, those are those are that they've been platted and they've been recorded, and they could be built on today, or 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 what does that exactly mean when when we say that there's so a certain number of entitled uh, lots available in our in our community? Yeah, that that's dwelling units that have land use approval that are either approved that construction hasn't started or they are under construction now. In Ogden, it's it's almost all multifamily. So. And does that mean then that the developer is is already paying property taxes, uh, the higher taxes on that and so forth because it's been through that approval process? Because that would seem like, is, is that when that triggers or does that not trigger until construction actually starts? Uh, I don't think it's, it triggers until construction actually starts. Okay. So that's probably part because we were thinking. I was wondering if that triggered earlier once the plat was approved and recorded, uh, because that would be a motivation to get out there and start turning some, turning some dirt and getting something yeah. to come forward. So yeah. that that's the clarification I was looking for. Thanks. Okay, go ahead and share. All right. I, okay, I'm not technical savvy here, but if I push share screen, it's going to share something. It should. Yep, it looks like it is. Not that button. Oh, wait, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Can people see that? Yes. Yeah. Okay, this is from Todd Littman's VPTI, whatever uh, uh, monthly newsletter I get out. These are from British Columbia. I have never seen townhomes like this ever. And, it, and so I sent one out to our planning commission and city council because they're always looking for ideas too. But look at that. Uh, not only are the uh, different variation in the uh, pop out there, the the can uh, cantilever, but the arched uh, uh, doorways, the t that roof, holy cow! And in the third story, there is a uh, uh, it's in the attic, so to speak. It's in the vault, and and then and then it alternates. It's there's a little balcony or not a little gated off here. Anyway, it's really cool. And then right in the front. They have a, a garden area, a, a patio, and uh, so my mission is to find out where this is at in British Columbia, so I can see the rest of the project. And then another one, uh, and I just sent this out a week ago to our city council and planning commission. But another one is this one at 1700 South and Ninth East. It's by the Fresh Market. This is the side of the townhomes. And there's a drop in elevation from here down to where the garages are down in here. And then there's this, uh, I mean, there's there's a, a pathway between, uh, and then the fresh mark, this is 1700 South right over here. The fresh market's over here, but look at that bus side. Across the street, Dave. Pardon? There's a bus stop across the street. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> look, at, look at that. Usually on a lot of times on the side of townhomes, there's a blank wall of um, uh, of nothing with an uh, usually stucco with an obligatory window, and that's it. And uh, these look like fronts, not sides. And the fronts are just as good looking, and uh, you know I have just as much going on as uh, there's the fronts. Whoops, get around here. And so I always thought that that was cool, it, and. And they've been around for a while now. And they're three stories, even though they look like two-story townhomes. Oh, wow. Great. So, okay. That's my share. All right. And I think uh, we are hit our time limit here. So, um, um, Barton, there is a, a, we don't have to talk about it, but there's um, a chat from Peter and Clinton about the private street. So if people have answers oh, yeah. to that, they can just drop it in the chat. Yeah. How do I unshare? Does somebody want to take this away from me? <laughs> okay.
Hey, I, I just wanted to throw out, this is Brent Chamberlain. I just put a link in here, some other townhomes. I actually used to live in Vancouver, BC for about nine years. So I've seen a lot of different townhomes. Um, this is a project that was actually quite interesting for those who might be curious. It sort of combines an alley style with a, a mixed centric um, communal style. Of, you get about 10 townhomes that are facing one another with a central a central area between them. So you get a lot of children's play um, and little garden and those kind of things, but it's, it's really dense. And then the homes leave out via back alley. Wow. Nice. And it's really nice from the street frontage, right? So you don't, you also don't have the kind of noise because the homes are turned perpendicular to the, the main roadways. Yeah. yeah be nice. Good. All right. So we can continue if you, other if this inspired you let's we can add some more next time i don't want to keep people longer today so uh yeah so plan if this inspired you to find something or some ugly example please bring it next time so um with that is there any other business that we had okay so uh we will adjourn and we will see everybody in february thank you all right bye bye thank you dave oh that's